Thank you, Justin, for that kind introduction. Um, and I'm hoping my slides will magically appear. Ta-da! <laughs> and thank you, Laura, for the opportunity to speak at such a tremendous event. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about a particular problem uh, that uh, some of my colleagues and I at UC Davis have been trying to solve using mobile health technology um, in early psychosis care, and that's the relapse problem. So relapse, defined as the return of positive symptoms, such as hallucination and delusion, occurs in about 80% of individuals um, with psychosis receiving care in the community setting within three years of illness onset. Even with specialized early intervention programs, still up to half of individuals are relapsing within three years of their first psychotic episode. It's a little better, but it's still a pretty bad indictment of a system that's supposed to keep people well. Um, and this is, as we heard this morning, something that contributes to the deteriorating course of illness, increased disability, and ever-rising costs of care. Um, and so my colleagues and I at UC Davis decided to try and solve this problem. Um, with the idea that uh, we could use mobile health technology to do regular monitoring for relapse predictors, um, which could alert both the provider and the client to impending relapse and facilitate early intervention. Um, so the data I'm going to be blitzing you with today uh, is from two studies that we have run testing mobile health platforms that combine a client-facing app with a clinician-facing dashboard um, and using it as an add-on tool in outpatient early psychosis care with the goal to improve information sharing between client and provider. In both studies, participants completed daily and weekly surveys via the app. Survey data were then populated on the dashboard and integrated into regular treatment settings. We also collected passive data. I will not be talking about that today. Daily surveys um, included questions around mood, whether you took your medications or not, and what your socializing activities were. Weekly questions um, included a set of questions around a variety of symptoms known to predict later relapse. Um, in fact, that's true for the daily questions as well. So the first question we tried to answer with our studies was whether integrating a mobile health platform into outpatient care is even feasible in early psychosis individuals. So typically the question is asked whether clients will even be willing to use an app that tracks their behavior. Will they complete surveys at all? Will they complete a few and then forget the app exists? And how much money will it cost to implement? Um, is it essentially possible to do? Um, so we had 143 individuals enrolled at the UC Davis Early Psychosis Program at the start of this study. 76 of those individuals enrolled in the study for up to 14 months. Average time in study was 183 days with a pretty broad range as you can see. And survey completion was pretty high. Weekly survey completion 77%, daily 69 Neither of these statistics was related to baseline symptom severity. So the idea that your really sick people can't do this is not the case in this data set. The second question we tried to answer was whether self-report via smartphone is even a valid method of assessing early psychosis symptoms. So we were trying to compare the self-report data to gold standard clinician rated assessments, which is the standard of care in outpatient settings. Um, to do this analysis, we used mixed effect uh, linear models to characterize the longitudinal relationship between weekly survey data and clinician rated data. And we found that indeed self-report data through the smartphone was associated with clinician rated data for positive symptoms and for depression and anxiety symptoms, but not for negative symptoms. And I have a few ideas as to why that's the case, and I'm happy to discuss that with people afterwards. The, set, the third question we try to answer was whether symptom ratings predict symptom exacerbations later on, which is really the million dollar question, isn't it? We're trying to predict relapse, so is it even possible? Um, and the preliminary answer is yes. So to orient you to the plots that I'm showing you on this slide, the black line here tells you the overall group relationship between the predictor variable, in this case depression, and positive symptoms one week later. The colored lines represent individual trajectories for the individuals in the data set. As you can see here, an increase in depression predicts an increase in positive symptoms one week later. Similarly, an uh, increase in anxiety predicts an increase in positive symptoms one week later. And an increase in visual perceptual abnormalities, so seeing, seeing uh, shadows out of the corner of your eye, doing a visual double take, that sort of thing, predicts a positive symptom increase one week later. And so this preliminary analysis does seem to indicate that, yes, indeed, we can use this self-report data to predict symptom exacerbations um, in the future. And so it could be integrated into care. 
In study two, we sought to answer another feasibility question, which is whether we can implement mobile health platforms in community-based early psychosis care. So study one was done in the context of the UC Davis Medical Center, an academic research setting with a pretty robust research infrastructure in place. And everybody at our clinic agrees that research is a good idea. Right? They agree that it's good to integrate this into care. About 90% of the patients in our clinic are enrolled in some kind of research study at some point in time. But if we're trying to deploy mobile health technology into the trenches, we need to figure out if community-based organizations, in the absence of research infrastructure, will even adopt this technology. And we need to figure out if we can do it in the absence of monetary incentives. So we paid people for their surveys in study one, and that's the typical model in most of these initial feasibility studies. We also wanted to find out if community providers would even adopt mobile health technology as part of their regular care, which really is the second million dollar question. Uh, so to answer this question, we approached 108 eligible um, early psychosis clients across four um, clinical sites across Northern California, all doing early psychosis care. 61 of those individuals um, enrolled across those sites for up to five months. Uh, this is the breakdown of the four clinics. So. Um, SACIDAPT, Aldea Napa, and Aldea Solano are all county-based clinics. So this is mostly medical, um, you know, state-funded care, underserved populations, um, et cetera. And then EDAPT is our insurance and self-pay clinic at UC Davis. Uh, 41 of those individuals completed the study. Average length and uh, average time in study was 156 days, so still pretty high. People are staying there for a long time. Um, and survey completion, although lower than study one, is still pretty impressive since we didn't pay them for their participation and we had no research infrastructure to support them in doing these surveys. No phone calls to remind them, no appointments or check-ins with research assistants. This is just real world. Will people do this as part of their care? And finally, we asked the question whether providers would adopt mobile health technology into community-based care. So do they even integrate it into sessions, right? The data are available to them, but are they going to use it? Um, when they do use it, how useful is it? How long do they use it for? What kind of impact does it have on their care? And does it facilitate early intervention? And the preliminary data that I have is the answer is, is yes, probably, although there are some pretty significant barriers that exist. But I feel pretty confident that those barriers are addressable, and I'll tell you why in a second. So we had about 20 providers enrolled, the um, majority of which were psychotherapists. We had a couple of um, psychiatrists as well. They had on average about six clients each over the course of the study that were enrolled. And we asked our therapists to complete weekly surveys regarding their dashboard use. Only 12 of them completed at least one. So you remember how I was really excited about the patients completing their surveys? It turns out that getting clinicians to do this is really hard. Um, so it was super hard to get data on how they're using it. And, um, I think this is uh, representative of an overburdened system. These people are inundated with uh, clients that need support. They have very heavy documentation requirements. And adding an extra thing for them to do each week is a pretty, it's a pretty big ask. Despite that, we have some interesting data. So they saw approximately two of their enrolled clients each week. They used the dashboard for at least for approximately one of those sessions each week. Um, when they did use it, they discussed it for about 10 minutes of a 15-minute session. Um, and when they used it, it was rated as moderately useful. And one of the things I wasn't able to fit in the time today was some of the qualitative feedback that we got from clients and um, providers about the sorts of things that this data prevented. So, uh, you know, learning that their um, uh, script at the pharmacy had lapsed so they couldn't take their medication for a couple of days. We learned that early using this app and were able to fix that problem immediately before any relapse occurs. The most common reported major barrier to use from both providers and clients alike was technical difficulties. So I have to admit that the app that we used in this study was pretty glitchy. Um, the user interface wasn't particularly pleasant to engage with. The dashboard didn't always populate the data accurately. And so it was um, not necessarily pleasant to engage with. And the good news about that is it's addressable. We can build a better product. We can make the user interface better. Um, the take-home message here is that um, integrating a mobile health platform is feasible in this population, even in the absence of monetary incentives. Symptom data gathered via smartphone is valid and seems to predict later exacerbations. Both clients and providers have endorsed the utility of it in their care. 
Um, and although the barriers to adoption are present, they're addressable. We can make a better product, and that's exactly what we're doing at UC Davis right now. We're making a bigger and better version of this technology using input from our clients and providers. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that with anyone later who's interested. Thank you very much.